My name is Ralph Works, managing editor of the Middle Daily News. And I noticed just like in church, there's more empty seats up front than there are in the back. So it's pretty normal. Um, to get started with these two gentlemen who are going to de be debating tonight, uh, I just wanted to make, let you know that they got more guts than I have because I've learned after 30 years in the newspaper business, uh, you know, as a reporter and as a managing editor now, that there's three things you don't write about if you don't want to get criticized. And that's one of abortion, one of gun control, and the other one's evolution. So you can't change anybody's mind, so you just try to educate. Um, the two gentlemen are frequent letter writers for the Middle Daily News. And I've come to know their thoughts and their, their deeds over the years. And I've come to respect both their positions because they're very committed, but they're very civil about it. And that's one of the things that I think we need to take into consideration tonight. When you frame your questions, make sure they're all very civil and because this is not a personal debate. This debate has been going on since probably before Charles Darwin published the species book back in 1859, 151 years ago. And it's been going on in the United States for a lot longer than the monkey trial in Tennessee in 1925. So I don't think it's been settled at that time. We're probably not going to settle anything tonight. So let me introduce both the people. On my left is Bruce Malone. He has 28 years of research experience with the Dow Chemical Company and retired as a research leader position in 2008 in order to spend full time presenting the evidence for creation. Bruce has a BS degree in chemical engineering from the University of Cincinnati and holds 17 patents for new products with Dow. He has authored and co-authored four books on the evidence for creation and over 90,000 copies are in circulation. Bruce and his wife Robin have been married for 26 years and have four children. They have been Midland residents for 13 years. On my right is John Cleveland Host, has never debated before, and his scientific expertise is in material science, not in biology, geology, or any of the other fields relevant to evolution. But he is a lifelong supporter of science education. He has studied material science at Michigan Tech, <coughs> earned his PhD degree in material science at Northwestern. He has authored a half dozen papers through the peer review process, including a paper in the journal Nature. Since 1997, he has worked at Hemlock Semiconductor. Uh, he has taught general science education education classes at local colleges. Uh, he grew up near Pontiac and has lived in Michigan most of his life. John and his wife live here in Midland with their three sons and he enjoys hunting, kayaking, and camping. His three sons have been his inspiration for a greater involvement in promoting education science. With that said, uh, also in the program you can see how we're going to be uh, organizing tonight. Each person will get 25 minutes to present their, their program. And it's already been, it's not a coil flip, by the way, it's a coin flip. And it's already been taken care of, and Bruce it will be going first. Uh, and then, after each presentation, there'll be a, like a three-minute response. And then, after both people have given their answers, then we will be going in for a small 10-minute inter intermission. And then we'll come back for questions. If anybody has any questions, pull down the cards. Uh, Joel and Tyler Roy will be around to pick up the cards and bring them up to me. Uh, I will be asking the questions. I'll try to ask the questions in the order that I get them. But if there's some redundancies or anything of that nature, I'll take the editorial position of reorganizing myself. So, um, And if it looks like there's going to be way too many, because I figure we can get in six to eight, um, questions at the end, maybe more if, they're, if they don't go very long because each person will have a chance to respond to them, then I will take that opportunity also to um, pick the questions that we're going to get in and, it's, and unfortunately some might not. So, but let's begin our debate. Bruce Malone. This looks, this looks like a place to be in Midland tonight. Thank you so much for coming. I know there's many things you could have been doing, but you chose to come and uh, listen to the two of us talk about where we came from, and I thank you for that. Um, I Hopefully I will be able to bring some clarity tonight. I, I think that's my goal, is to just do some teaching of things that you are going to get to hear in the museums and the public schools because they are essentially left out. You don't get to hear the science that lines up with anything but evolution out there. In reality, 
There are only two possibilities for why you are all sitting there in those seats, why you exist. Um, either one sort of creature turned into another sort of creature that turned into another sort of creature. In other words, natural processes over enormous periods of time made you as a human being, or you were created. Now, those are the only two possibilities. Either the coded language, which is on the DNA molecule, is there as a result of an intelligent designer, or it happened by random mutational changes filtered by natural selection. Those are the only two possibilities. Either there was an enormous worldwide water catastrophe on this planet as an explanation for the fossil record and the geology and the river cranes and the ice age and so on, or enormous periods of time created the geological record. There's no other possibility. It's one or the other. So the question is, how can science guide us toward what is the truth? Because I would hope that's what we're all after. What is the truth? The reality is science cannot prove either possibility in a definitive way. Karl Popper, Dr. Karl Popper, he was kind of a founder of how does science work and really defining it as a systematic method in the 30s and 40s, a scientific philosopher. He said science works by showing which of possibility is the least likely, and that's the one you eliminate. It can never definitively prove one thing or another. Evolution is presented as a fact all around us, but it's not. It is really a philosophy that the, the data is then filtered through. Now, this is the way Carl put it. He said, science is like the white swan test. Now, what is that? Suppose I had a theory that said all swans are white. Now, would I go about proving that theory by going to Indiana and finding another white swan, and Colorado and finding another white swan, and flying over to Europe and finding another white swan, and everywhere I look, I find more and more white swans in order to prove my theory? No, it's gotta, you've got to find some way of falsifying it. I've never found anything evolutionists are willing to accept as falsifying their theory. They just fit it and mold it and change it to fit what they want to believe. In reality, the way you disprove something is to look for a black swan. Then you've proven all swans aren't white. And that's the kind of things we're going to look at. Now my opponent, I suspect, is going to start lining up fossils in the fossil record and see, see how they line up and show the pattern of evolution? Well, that fits creation just as well, very distinct kinds. Nobody disputes there's all sorts of variations within a given set of DNA information of a given type of animal. Well, lots of varieties of cows, lots of varieties of corn, lots of kinds of dogs that vary within a kind. The question is, can you start with no information content and random goo and have random changes and have that goo go through the zoo to turn into you? Kind of like, are we goo men or are we created? That's the real question. And you don't do that by lining things up and saying, see, this proves evolution, or showing similarities between things. That's looking for the white swans. You do it by saying, do the laws of science confirm or undermine this whole belief in evolutionary thought? Another way of looking at it, did stuff, just matter and energy, turn into life that became conscious as mankind and then invented this idea of God? That's essentially what's taught in the school systems and museums and everywhere. Because it's assumed in our education system that the entire universe is like this box. Everything is the box. There's nothing that made the box. The box made itself. That's evolution in a nutshell. But the other possibility isn't even allowed viewing within our school systems. The idea that there is an intelligent designer. We call him God. And that he made the stuff, he made the box, he made life, and he made mankind. See, there's the two possibilities shown in another way. What science has to explain is where these kind of things came from. Is all the tune design the perfect electric? electromagnetic constants, the, the, the strong and the weak magnetic force, the perfect position of Earth, the perfect distance from the sun, everything that holds the universe together, the charge of the electron, the, the constants of gravity, all of them that have to be perfectly tuned for life to be possible, are those all just a matter of random chance? Or is it a tuned design? Is this possessified information design of DNA, I'm going to talk about that as we move along, a result of random processes, the property of matter, or is there a designer? 
are living organisms, the interdependent design that makes organisms and every part of organisms possible a result of design or just a property of matter. Only science can answer that. And this is what you get in the schools and the textbooks. Well, just lots of time and chance explains it all. That's just a smoke screen. That's not science, that's belief. Or mutations filtered by natural selection explain it all. We'll talk specifically about that as we move along. Or just an infinite amount of time. That's a reliance on faith, not science. Or maybe it's the property of matter itself. Well, we'll look at the laws of science to see is it or isn't it. Or maybe just chaos theory. That's real popular now. Order can happen in chaos. Well, that's another faith statement. Has not been proven. Of all the things you'll hear about in the school systems, the things that are allowed in school, there's one possibility that's always left out. Isn't that interesting? Created by intelligence. It's simply left out. And the data which would tend to lead us to that conclusion isn't even shown to the kids. That one is off limits. What a crazy situation we find ourselves in in this nation. Only guiding people toward one possible conclusion. You see, that's indoctrination. That's not education, because one of the possibilities is being left out. Now, you all know this, the evolution model. As I said, what's presented as evolution are minor variations between creatures that neither one of us disagree happen. But does that explain the upward development of life? Can hydrogen gas come together in a vacuum to form a star? That's cosmic evolution. Can chemicals come alive? Never been done. We're not even close to even beginning to explain how that could happen in a laboratory. All sorts of reasons it could not happen. Never been done. Co chemical evolution. Then life diversified in one form turned into another, that turned into another, that turned into another. And finally, monkeys of some sort turned into man. Biological evolution supported by this idea of geological evolution. You know, in graphically, it's like explosion formed all this matter and energy somehow. And all that information on the DNA code, it is information just developed by chance. And then you line up the fossils, which I'm sure my, my opponent here is going to do, kind of line them up and say, well, see, we can place them in this order, and that proves evolution's happened. And then you get to the little end, of the branch at the end, and you say, well, monkeys look closest to us, apes look closest to us, we'll line them up, we'll see any variation of human skulls, that must have been humans evolving, any variation of ape skulls that were apes turning into humans, and we'll line those up. See, it's a story. That's what's going on throughout the educational system. Well, there's another model. You see... In, in my mind, it doesn't even qualify as science. It's a model, a belief system to fit the data into. There's another model, which also doesn't qualify as science per se, but it's a model to help understand reality. And I think the best one is really the biblical model. It says the universe and life was designed. It looks like a design because it has a designer. There were very distinct forms of life that were formed by this designer. Death is a result of our actions. It hasn't been here for millions and billions of eons in time. But you've got to explain the rock layers. They're there because there was an enormous water-wide world restructuring catastrophe that really is a reality of this planet. And that's where you get the rock layers and the fossils and so on. And the people diversified into people groups after that. It's another model to explain reality. Now, we both have the same data, we have the same rocks, we have the same fossils. It's a matter of which one fits the reality of the evidence best. And you can't figure this out in a philosophy class or a religion class. You see, we've got to talk about cosmology and science of cosmology and physics. We've got to talk about biology. If the Bible gave us a model to understand reality, ten times in the first chapter it says, creatures reproduce after their own kind. Ten times. Birds, trees, fish, cattle, other things, reproduce after their own kind. You see, that's biology. The only way you're going to figure out if it's true is to go study the biological world. So it belongs in a classroom to figure it out if it's true or not. Psychology. Every human heart is fractured. Is there something wrong there? Why can't we always, 100% of the time, do what we know is right? See, there's a problem here. That's psychology. Geology talks more about this worldwide flood in the Bible than it does creation itself. Presented in a very straightforward way as a reality and fact of history. And in history, see, those are scientific disciplines to be studied not in a religion class, but in science. But they're left out. They're left out of our school system. Now, this is why. 
You know, Kansas said, if you're going to teach evolution, at least teach the problems with it in Kansas in 1999. The media went ballistic. The scientific establishment went ballistic. They moved in with their editorials. They said, we're going to drag the kids into the dark ages. They'll never be able to compete. This was one of the editorials by a PhD scientist. Even if all the data pointed to an intelligent designer, we'd have to exclude it because it doesn't say the box is all there is, and that's the only thing that's allowed in our schools. Isn't that a travesty? It's a travesty. We're not even allowed to show people the data. So let's look at the data. The first law of thermodynamics. By the way, a law is only a law of science if there's never been an exception, never been anything that's ever been shown to be wrong with it. It says matter and energy can be neither created nor destroyed. Now this is a huge elephant in the living room problem for naturalism, for evolution. Then where did everything come from? You can't explain it, because it goes against what we know about the laws of science. Creation at least has a cause and effect. There's something outside the box that made the box. Evolution, as I said earlier, is faith. It has faith that nothing exploded and became everything. Now, lest you think it's just me making this up, I'm going to show a little two-minute video clip of a PhD cosmologist from the University of Arizona explaining <laughs> cosmic evolution to us all. I'm Jana, and I'm a professor of physics and astronomy. I work on where it all started. The simplest picture of the Big Bang starts with nothing. There's really nothing. There's no space, there's no time, there's no matter, there's no energy. It's nothing but the potential to exist. And out of that bursts the universe. Time starts, space is created, all the matter and the energy in the universe is born at that moment. In the first minute fraction of a second, the universe inflates. And then about three minutes later, atoms begin to form. And about five billion years later, galaxies begin to form. One of these galaxies, about 10 million years later, a little ordinary planet forms. And 14 billion years later, people evolve. We're at the last bleep um, in the cosmic history. The Big Bang is often misunderstood as an explosion in space, as though space existed and time existed, and there was just this explosion of matter and energy into space. But something much more profound than that is going on, and that is space itself is created in the Big Bang, and time is created in the Big Bang. The Big Bang describes the origin of the entire universe. But we also know that the math that we're doing on pen and paper isn't going to be the whole story. It's possible that the universe was really a bounce from a previous history where the universe was already big and started to collapse and bounced out into a new Big Bang. And then we were born in this cosmos that we think started 14 billion years ago, but really it goes back infinity to infinity. Uh, eternity of bounces and cycles like this, or it's possible that our universe is just one kind of bubble or plume off of a patchwork of other bubbles and plumes, and so there's other universes out there, it's like a megaverse, but we can't contact them, so for all we know, this is it, this is the whole cosmos, back to our beginning and our big thing, but it might not be that way. But we know something happened, something that created a hot space from which the universe expanded and evolved. Okay, something happened, but we're in agreement there. You say space, none of that's provable. Infinite universes, infinite time, nothing. Just the potential to be something existed. See, it's faith, faith, faith presented as if it's reality and science. And, uh, but it's done in such glitzy ways that people just kind of buy into it. So. Is it, actually, all our observations when we really understand science, say it couldn't have happened. You see, when you put hydrogen gas in a vacuum of space, it does not gravitationally collapse to become a star. We're told that maybe of all sorts of possibilities, maybe there were supernovas that created shock waves that drove gases together to form stars. Well, where did the stars come from to form the supernovas to form the shock waves? It's just circular, circular thing. And furthermore, we've never seen a star even form. Not once have we taken a photograph of the sky and 50 years later compared to another photograph and see a new star. So observation and theory can't explain it. Here's uh, Stephen Hawking's essentially saying the same thing. He says, smartest man on the, on the planet, some people say. 
We can't even develop a model of how the cosmos forms without mixing ideology. That's just a fancy way of saying we have to start with faith to even develop a model of the universe. Stephen Hawking. But he goes on to say in another book, A Brief History of Time, Nevertheless, the Big Bang is in agreement with all observational evidence we have today. In other words, the Big Bang explains everything. Same thing Janice says, same smokescreen you hear throughout the media and school system. Because if the Big Bang doesn't explain everything, there's something outside the box, and we can't acknowledge that. Therefore, the Big Bang explains everything, says Stephen Hawking. Except a few sentences down on the same page, he says, except, well, there's a few unanswered questions. We can't explain how even a single star formed or any of the galaxies formed. What else is there in the universe? See, it's enormous problems the students don't even get to hear about. But it gets worse. The second law of thermodynamics, lots of ways of stating it, but it says things naturally increase in disorder. Here's a kid that says, I don't want to clean my room, maybe it'll get cleaner. It's a cartoon because we know it'll never happen. Order can only increase if there's an ordering mechanism and there's an energy conversion mechanism. Left to itself, things are going to get more disorderly. The usable energy will get used up, so you know there's an increase in entropy, but unless there's an ordering mechanism that works and a way to control the energy, you can't have a tornado sweep through building materials and turn it into a building. Now, I do experiments, and I've done them all my life. It's what I do as a scientist. So I thought, I'll do an experiment. I took a picture of a frog out of a textbook and I made a copy. And then I took the copy and made a copy, and the second copy and made a third copy. That's what life does. It makes a copy of a copy of a copy. Well, is there going to be something that's clearer? Is there going to be new features formed? Is there going to be increased information content? No, 50 generations later, it's getting worse. 100 generations later, it's disappearing. 200 generations later, its nose, its arms are gone. It's not getting better. Same thing is happening with life as we'll show. Now this is what my opponent is going to present. This is reality. This is fact. This is science. Does this equation work? Can simple life form, first of all? And if it does, can you take mutations and natural selection in lots and lots and lots of time and turn it into a person? In other words, is that grandpa? <laughs> and that's the picture out of a textbook. I mean, some of you laugh. Some of you are dead serious. This is reality, because this is right out of a textbook. But that's a valid question. Is that our great, great, great ancestor grandpa? Well, I'm going to skip everything else and just jump to DNA. DNA is specified complexity. Any definition you try to develop for what is a language is going to fit DNA. It is a sequence pattern of non-repeated information. It performs a function. It causes things to happen. It is received by receptors. It is a language, or perhaps a better is a computer operating system or a programming code. None of these things could ever arise by chance processes. And natural selection couldn't have existed before DNA. So why would we believe those sort of things written on every living organism on this planet is a result of chance processes? You see, this is complexity, pure randomness. You could have an equation that could define that. You hear life formed on a clay or a crystal somewhere where it lined things up, or snowflakes show order. But it doesn't give an information content. It only lines things up. You see, that's specified complexity, a message that carries a purpose and performs a function. Life is full of these irreducibly complex machines. See, a mousetrap has five parts. If any of them are missing, it's a piece of junk. It's a pile of non-functioning nothing. So they all got to be there in the right position, in the right place to do a thing. Life is full of thousands of these. One of them is just the little flagella that spins at 10, 20,000 RPM at the bottom of a bacteria. It has an electric motor at the bottom of it. Go home and take a piece out of your electric motor and see if it works. See if it evolves into something different. It's all got to be there, or it's a drag line with no particular function. It's the power of preconceptions that can see that incredible design and say, gee, it has a useful function, therefore evolution explains it. That doesn't explain anything. It's just a word. How did it all come together? Simple life is way too complex to have developed. Mutations destroy information. We've been doing an experiment for over 100 years where we irradiate fruit flies 
at a thousand times what the normal radiation level, we get fruit flies with twisted wings, different colored eyes, different numbers of bristles, never get a new organ, never get a new functioning feature. See, this is science, this is experimentation. Never get a new developing increase in information content. Mutations aren't going to drive things upwards. Ah, but here's the biggie. This is for we're probably going to wrap up. Charles Darwin proposed natural selection. Well, natural selection is like this. When I was young, I had a wagon, and I loved my wagon. I would ride around in my wagon. It was my mode of transportation. But as I grew, my kids are getting bicycles and tricycles and other things that are more advanced forms of transportation. Let's line them up. That's evolution. Wagon to tricycle, bicycle, motorcycle to car. Evolution proven. Except they're all designed. Well, if my wagon is a simple cell organism, I didn't want just a bicycle or a car or a motorcycle. What I really wanted was a Starship Enterprise to ride around in. Now how am I going to turn my wagon into the Starship Enterprise? <laughs> this is the way evolution says it would work. The wagon rolls off, and on the bottom of the wagon, attached underneath, are the assembly directions. Everything you need to make the next wagon. All of the code to make the presses, the paint, the factory, the bricks, the building, the employee benefits manual, a library of information attached to my single cell organism. Natural selection is the quality control department. It looks at the wagon, it says it's the right shape, it's the right size, it rolls, off it goes, now make the next wagon. But life does this. It uses the information in the DNA to make the next wagon. It has to use what's there to rebuild the entire factory to make the next wagon. Well, we now know as geneticists, every time a wagon produces a wagon, or a sing any form of life produces a form of life, it makes mistakes, like maybe 10 letters that we have to mark out. Of the whole volume of information, only 10 letters. So now we have a wagon rolling up the assembly line. It has 10 letters that now long no longer make sense. And it uses that information, which the quality control department can't see. Evolution, natural selection, can't see the DNA. It can only see, does the critter function? So it makes the next wagon. Ten letters out of maybe a million aren't going to make any difference. But then there's ten more. The permanent changes. And ten more, and ten more, and ten more. And a thousand generations later, there's ten thousand rearranged letters on the operating directions. And 10,000 generations later, there's a million random changes. So now wagons start rolling off of wheels and problems. Maybe one of those wagons said a word red got changed to blue, it was a blue wagon, and it sells well. But it takes with it all that detrimental changes. Is that process, is random mutations filtered by the quality control department going to change this wagon into the Starship Enterprise? Absolutely not. It's going to deteriorate and deteriorate and deteriorate. Life can't be millions of years old because we now know as geneticists that's exactly what's happening to every form of life on this planet. Natural selection can only change significant and beneficial changes. But life is full of thousands of little, tiny, insignificant changes that are just destroying the information content. See, that's science. You can't discuss this in a philosophy class. Students have the right to see this sort of perspective, but it's all just covered up because evolution is presented as a fact. Because if it's not, then the box didn't make itself, and that's out of limits in our school system to be shown to students. It's a travesty. Natural selection does not explain the upward advancement of life, just the variation of information that's already present there on the molecule. Um, real, how much time do I have? One minute. I don't have time to get into geology. Maybe we can do it during questions. But the flood is the bottom line. If there was a flood, it would have created the rock seams and the fossils and it would have buried trillions of things. There would have been rapid continental movement. And there are major, brilliant PhD geophysicists that have shown there would have been rapid seduction of the ocean floor and rapid movement of the continents and building up of the mountain chains after this flood event. That's the model for history that we look at. The fossils don't talk. If you assume evolution, you're just going to look at it and you're going to interpret that data consistent with your belief system. And it's going to blind you to interpreting it any other way. So the assumption of evolution is going to lead you to interpreting it consistently. 
And the other option is creation. Okay, thank you. I, I almost finished. <laughs> points I want to make in rebuttal. Um, I'm going to talk, there's obviously a lot of things to talk about there, and it would be great to be able to address them all. What I'm going to address is irreducible complexity. Uh, he showed the uh, bacterial flagellum. Uh, there's plenty of other examples, most of them from Michael Behe's book. Uh, again, two main points I want to make. The first one, irreducible complexity is presented as proof that it could not have evolved. That is false yeah, because Microphone. That's false because irreducibly complex systems certainly can evolve. The idea that they can't is based on a misunderstanding of how evolution works. It doesn't work by adding one part at a time. It works by add, uh, slowly evolving the whole system and sometimes by removing parts that might be redundant. Scientists recognized this a long time ago, and in fact, it was an evolutionary scientist who predicted that evolution would make things that were irreducibly complex. In 1918, before Michael B, he was even in diapers. That says that irreducibly complex things show evolution because uh, because they're a predicted outcome of evolution. He called it interlocking complexity. It's really the same thing. So that's one point. The other point is that the majority of these systems, in fact, I can't think of a counterexample, all the systems that I've seen that have been presented as irreducibly complex, such as the bacterial flagellum, such as the blood clotting cascade, such as the eye, um, all of them are generally known in uh, biological circles, uh, it's generally known different ways that they could have evolved. And in most cases, we have actual evidence to show what route they took, including often transitional forms. The fact that these systems not only can evolve, are predicted in certain realms to have evolved, and that we have evidence as to how they evolve, usually isn't shown by creationists arguing for irreducibly complex items. Now, they might not know or they might know and not be telling you, of course, I can't know that. But the bottom line is that when someone produces something that's irreducibly complex and talks about it, it usually boils down, even Michael Behe saying this, it usually boils down to the simple statement that follows. It usually means, if you listen to it carefully, because I don't understand biology, I want you to reject evolution. When someone says something is irreducibly complex, that's usually what they're saying. And a uh, few of my no please. And I'll take my extra ten minutes to grab a coat. Mm -hmm. Bye. Ready? <coughs> And I'll take these few seconds before that pops up to uh, echo Bruce's comment. It's great to see everyone here tonight. And um, I also want to point out that among other things that Bruce and I may share, we both share a fascination with the evidence. There's a lot of really neat things to see out there. Um, okay, so tonight I'm going to try to talk about four main points. The first one I want to talk about is Christianity and evolution, the relationship between those two. The next one is some of the evidence regarding origins. Um, obviously, I won't be able to cover it all because uh, there's an awful lot of evidence there. The uh, next one is what scientists think of this evidence, and then talk a little bit about creationism. Okay, so moving on. From early on, the scientists who established evolution and who established an old age geology understanding of the Earth's history were by and large Christians. You look at the big names, and you've got Mendel and Lyell and De Vries and Avery and others. You've got a Protestant minister and a Catholic priest. Why did they do this? If this was somehow against Christianity? Uh, they did it because they looked at this and they realized that evolution and a deep time understanding of the Earth can actually support Christian doctrine. 
So these ideas were established mostly by Christians for, at the time, Christians and everyone else now. If we look at um, not just the people who established these ideas, um, but instead we also look at just what general people today believe in the United States, what we'll find is most of the support for evolution and for a deep time understanding of the earth are Christians. <coughs> Now, that's not to say that there's not a good chunk of Christians that oppose these ideas. There are. There's no question it's controversial. Otherwise, Bruce and I wouldn't be here tonight. I'll take a slight diversion to point out one thing. In the lower right-hand corner of my slides, I'll usually have a reference. This is because everything I say tonight will be in accordance with, uh, with the scientific consensus and with the experts who've spent a lot more time looking at this than either Bruce and I, because neither Bruce or I are experts in this field. In this case, it's a Gallup poll, and a lot of times it will be a peer-reviewed paper. Okay, enough for the uh, general population. Let's talk about clergy. I'll talk first about Protestants. There are Protestant denominations like Jehovah's Witnesses that are explicitly creationist, but there's also a lot of Protestant denominations where most of their clergy and the um, denomination itself support evolution. You can see we've got the Evangelical Lutherans, the Methodists, the Presbyterians, and many more. Um, okay, good. Well, we've talked a little bit about Protestant clergy. Let's talk about Catholic clergy. The Catholic clergy strongly support evolution, um, most of them anyway, up to and including the Pope. If we look at what the Pope says about evolution, uh, the Pope will say that the first organism dwelt on this planet three and a half to four billion years ago, and that evolution is virtually certain. Okay, now, let's think about this for a second. We've got many, many Protestant clergy. In fact, if you look at the uh, Clergy Letter Project, that'll show signatures of thousands upon thousands of Protestant clergy in support of evolution. And, uh, and we've also got Catholic clergy. Now, these are people who spend their entire lives studying Christian doctrine and promoting Christianity and, and also studying the Bible, often knowing Hebrew and realizing that a lot of things in the Bible are clearly metaphors if you look at internal structure and things like that. They know that looking at the Bible and interpreting some of the passages as metaphors makes a lot of sense. For instance, if you look in the Song of Songs, it says, How beautiful you are, my darling. Your eyes are doves. Obviously, if you take that literally, it doesn't make any sense. But if you take it as a metaphor, it's a beautiful and meaningful metaphor. And many clergy will point out many beautiful and meaningful metaphors throughout the Bible, including Genesis. Okay, now I've talked a little bit about Christianity and evolution, about how this is a, um, an idea that supports core Christian doctrines. Um, for instance, a lot of these clergy will point out that when God walked the earth in the form of Jesus 2,000 years ago, he spoke often in parables and metaphors. Is it any surprise then that he would start off his revelation to us speaking in a metaphor? And again, this isn't just um, you know, John's view. This is something that the clergy will point out. Now, I'll move on to some of the evidence. Well, I'll talk about transitional fossils. Everybody loves transitional fossils. I do too, and there's a lot of really neat ones out there. We've got a clear transition from reptile or from lizard to mammal. You can see that this isn't, most people wouldn't consider a lizard and a small mammal to be the same kind. Um, we've got a beautiful transition, and if you look closely at this, um, you'll find out that I couldn't even fit them all in. There's a lot of intermediates in here, too, that I couldn't show for simplicity. And if we look just at the jaw bones, we can see the bones of the jaw slowly changing one to the next to evolve into our inner ear bones, which evolved from our lizard ancestors. Um, and again, there's full skeletons and such for these uh, that I can't show just for space. Moving on, we'll look at human evolution. There's a lot of transitional fossils for human evolution that fit the time scale, fit other predictions of evolution, including where they're from, and, clear, and clearly move very gradually <coughs> from something a lot like a chimpanzee. Here's a modern chimpanzee, here's an osteopithecine, and you can see a nice smooth transition up to a modern human. A lot of creationists will look at this and say, oh, each skull is either an ape or completely human. 
But you look at this and there's no place. You could draw a line on here and say everything to the left is obviously an ape and everything to the right is obviously a human. Okay. Anybody guess what this thing is? Who thinks it's a crocodile? Raise your hand. How about a big scary dinosaur? Any ideas? That's a good guess. Some people for a big scary dinosaur actually know. It is a transitional fossil. This is one of the skeletons that we find. A transitional fossil between a land animal and a whale. We've got a beautiful transitional series, according again to the experts, between land animals and whales. Again, um, you can say, oh, well, look at this. It's obviously a different kind from a whale. We've got a lot of transitional forms here. And these transitional forms show a nice variation of the features that I was talking about. Um, for instance, if we look at a feature like the position of the snout or the hind limbs or anything else in these things, they, you can see the transition as they slowly change from a land animal into a whale. <clears throat> now, let's look in a little bit greater detail at some of those features. Here we have a certain feature of the fossils. And again, you can see my reference down in the corner. This is according to the experts in this who have spent their entire lives studying, in often cases, just the whale evolution. You can look at each feature, like their hind limbs or their nose opening, or whether or not they have a tail feet, and see how it gradually changes from the uh, land animal to the whale. And you can see that we didn't just line these up. Geology lined these up for us because we've got the dates when these occurred, and you can see that they go in sequence of the uh, of the geological dates. In other words, the order of these was not determined by just us guessing which ones would fit in the best place. We look at this and we can see some specific features. For instance, take a look at the uh, take a look at the nose opening. It starts out as a nostril at the end of the snout here with pachycetus and then it slowly evolves to a blowhole at the top of the snout. It moves back and up like this. And it's important to note here that the features don't go in lockstep. For instance, if you look at the tail fluke, it evolves much earlier than the movement of the snout, which happens later and has to catch up. So if you look at something around this time, if you're looking back at uh, Dorodon, you'll see that the fluke of the tail is a lot like a modern whale but the snout is still closer to the front, even though it is transitional. Still a beautiful transitional form, and you can see all the features slowly evolving from one to another. So, we've got a lot more transitional fossils. I'd love to spend more time. Um, trial bites, I love trial bites. Um, and we've got a nice uh, fossil series of them evolving from trial bites up to land scorpions and producing horseshoe crabs along the way. I never knew that horseshoe crabs were trial bites. And we've got a lot more. We've got the classic fish to amphibian to lizard, and then we've got turtles, we've got transitional bats, we've got a lot of other mammals, um, and we've got Archaeopteryx. Again, a beautiful transitional form that has many features intermediate between a bird and a dinosaur. And the uh, nice thing about that is you can get these. Here's a replica of one of the many Archaeopteryx fossils we have. Uh, you can, I got this one here for about uh, 90 bucks. It's a nice uh, addition to anyone's decor and it honors science as well. So, um, I'm not selling these, by the way. <laughs> Put that off on the side for now and move on. There's literally hundreds and hundreds of more of these transitional fossils. Mike. Mike, Mike. Mike. thank you. <laughs> Okay, now I'm going to need to talk a little bit about uh, some of the genetic evidence. I'll talk about viruses, and this is a little bit creepy. It's creepy because of how retroviruses work. Retroviruses work by inserting their DNA into your cell, actually not just into your cell, but into your own DNA in your cell, and splicing it in. You can see it's spliced in there. And then when that cell reads your, uh, the DNA in its, in its cell to do whatever it's doing, like make a protein or something like that, it hits that patch of viral DNA, and, that, and so then it makes a virus, because that DNA says to make a virus. And that goes on to infect other cells. Now, at this point, cellular defenses, or, or sometimes mutations, will often disable that virus, and you'll be left with a virus carcass stuck in your DNA. Um, it turns out that 
if that happens to a sperm or an egg cell before conception, that virus carcass will be stuck in that genome for the offspring of that creature and will be carried on from then on. So, if we look at some creatures, what we'll find among the primates, and this is the family tree established by non-genetic ways first. It was established by homology, by uh, transitional fossils, and many other methods like that in science. You'll see that we've got these endogenous retroviruses right there in those creatures, in the same place in the genome. And that shows that these happen from the same infection event, and that means that these creatures share a common ancestor. In fact, we don't just have those two endogenous retroviruses, we've got more. And they reflect the same family tree. The interesting thing about this is, if you find some primate species that you haven't checked, tested for the endogenous retroviruses, based on the family tree, you can predict where these virus carcasses will be found. And when you look, there they are. Again and again, scientists have tested new species making the prediction of where these viruses' carcasses are, and there they are every time. Now let's move on to the vitamin C gene. If you look at animals, uh, mammals in particular, you'll find that they make vitamin C. But you and I can't make vitamin C. We have to take these supplements all the time. In fact, that's why people get scurvy. Both people in the modern world and in the past when they go on ocean voyages or other times, people will sometimes get scurvy if they're not getting enough vitamin C in their diet. Well, it turns out that we found the gene in these animals that makes vitamin C, and then we looked in our genome, and we found the same gene, gene in the same place. There it is. We can look at long stretches of DNA and recognize this gene, and we can see mutations that keep it from working. We've got a broken vitamin C gene in our genome. Now, the nice thing about this gene is it's not very long, so we can look at a good chunk of it right now. You want to see it? Here's the gene that makes vitamin C. Uh, this is the genetic code, T, G, G, A, G, A, 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 G, T, and etc. like that. I'll reduce the font a little bit so we can look at it more closely. Here it is in a human, chimp, monkey, and a rat. Now the neat thing here is that we found a mutation that keeps it from working. There it is right there. You can see that the rat can make vitamin C, the other uh, primates there, the primates there can't. And, uh, and the interesting thing about that is that it again shows the same family tree. It also shows other mutations that are, again, in accordance with what you would expect from a common descent model. It can't be a design function because it's a broken gene. It can't be a separate mutation because we've seen that this mutation is shared across the board. And we've got other mutations in exactly the same locations. So, when we look at the family tree, what does that tell us? It tells us that that's where the mutation happened, and that these are the creatures that can't make vitamin C. We find a creature that hasn't been genetically tested. There are, by the way, hundreds of primate species. Any one of them we find, we can predict that it'll have the same mutations in the vitamin C gene and won't be able to make vitamin C. And when the genetic tests are done, sure enough, it confirms it. We have thousands more genetic tests that confirm the same tree of life. It's not just that they confirm that some evolution happened or that this animal evolved into that one. That's easy. That's been established since the 1800s that animals can change. It's what it really establishes in every case is the same family tree of life with the same branch points, the same common ancestors, and the same routes of evolution. We use one DNA test to convict a murder. Remember, remember the uh, murder case from last summer, South here in Midland. We use one DNA test to convict a murderer, and yet in evolution, some people still doubt evolution, even though we have thousands, thousands of DNA tests that confirm the same tree of life. We also trust fraternity tests that are done the same way. And new DNA confirmations are published every month. Chromosome 2 also shows really interesting genetic information. I don't have time for that right now. So I'll move on again and confirm the same tree of life. And And there's lots of other evidence for evolution. Let's take a look at some of it. We talked about the genetic evidence. We just barely scratched the surface with any of this. Remember, people spend their whole lives studying one small aspect of this. We talked a little bit about a few transitional <laughs> fossils. All, the order of appearance also reflects evolution. Biogeography, 
homology, in other words, the structure of our bodies, shows evolution, uh, according to uh, the uh, scientists. And not only that, but if you look on a small scale, if you look at the molecules of proteins and things like that, they'll show the same nested order lines of descent that, um, that is expected from evolution, and it doesn't fit a design model. Now, I mentioned before that the Christian theologians, uh, many of them, uh, many Protestants and, and almost all Catholics, will point out that evolution supports core Christian doctrine. This is one example. They will argue that God is not a micromanager. God is not a micromanager. He's a very powerful creator, so powerful a creator that he can make a creation that can fill in the details itself. He's not a tinkerer. And so, when we look at things like how the giraffe is set up, we might say, okay, if God were a tinkerer, then how would you set this up? Well, if you're going to run nerves to the throat, you run from the brain to the throat. That's about a foot. But when we look at a giraffe, that's not what we find. How do you run the nerves from the brain to the throat in a giraffe? Like that! You run all the way down to the chest, run through the chest cavity, and run all the way back up to the throat, running 15 feet. That's not a good design. This is a place where the creation itself was able to fill in some of the details. Now, why would it be like that for evolution? Evolution predicts this, because if you look at a fish, that would be almost a straight line and a very short path. The giraffe, like all vertebrates, evolved from fish, and so you had to stretch out that neck, stretching out that nerve. There's a ton of these in humans and other animals, just designs that simply don't make sense if you think out to tinkerer. We also see confirmation from embryology where there's often very suboptimal designs where the embryo will grow something and then reabsorb it. Well, why would you do that? You do that because that's, that reflects the ancestry of how the organism's ancestors also developed. For instance, all of us started out life with a tail. We had a tail and we reabsorbed it. Now, we also see observed changes, and this reflects on that tail again. Sometimes that tail doesn't get reabsorbed. When that happens, we get babies born with tails. Now, that wouldn't happen if our monkey, if our monkey ancestors didn't have tails. Again, the theologians, the Christian theologians, will point out that evolution is consistent with Christianity, compatible with Christianity. We also see whales born with legs. We observe macroevolution on a regular basis. Um, and we see mutations, many mutations, that add information that add new abilities and that sometimes add whole new genes. And I hope we get into discussing the mechanism by that works. It works through a duplication mutation and uh, it's actually quite a fascinating process. So, let's move on and look again that all of this evidence for evolution from all these different fields, again, confirm the same tree of life. It's simple to say that they just show that animals can evolve from one to another, like a land animal into a whale, but it's so much more than that, because all these studies confirm the same tree of life. If any of them were unreliable, then what we would see would see a different tree of life, but that's not what we see. We see the same order of appearance, we see the same nested hierarchical structure that often does not include features that, are, um, that affect design or that are relevant to design. Okay, now, I've talked a little bit about um, the relationship between Christianity and evolution, showing that evolution and uh, Christianity are compatible, and that evolution is supported by uh, theologians, many of them Protestant, and many of them Catholic. I've talked about, again, just some of the evidence. There's so much more evidence that even if I were going to talk all night, I wouldn't be able to fit it in. Uh, now I'm on what scientists think. If we look at scientific societies, Many, many large scientific societies have published statements that say they support evolution. These are just some of them. I know of no scientific societies that have published statements that cast doubt on evolution or support creationism. The experts look at this and they say that there's no question that evolution is a fact. In fact, don't forget that these scientists, many of them, are Christian. You've got thousands and thousands of scientists who are Christian looking at this saying, oh yeah, there's no question. Okay, that's on, a, uh, that's on a general level. Let's look at an individual level. We do actually have data there. And what we find is that well over 95% of scientists support evolution. 
the, uh, there's a Pew survey that recently shows this. There's plenty of other data, including Project Steve, which I would encourage you to look at, show that practically all scientists, these are the people who know the data best, have looked at it and said, there's no question, evolution is a fact. Now, it's worth pointing out that, um, that with practically all scientists supporting evolution, um, what about these scientists here or there that might dispute it? Well, remember, scientists are people like you or me. And out of hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people, you're going to be able to find some that will believe anything. For instance, there was a study that came out, a survey that came out just last week, you might have seen, that showed that 20% of people really think that there are aliens disguised as people living among us. 20%? Now, out of hundreds of thousands of scientists, do you think you could find a couple that would believe anything? Of course you can. But it's an insignificant percentage. And again, practically all scientists support evolution. I want to briefly talk about the idea of theory. Saying something is just a theory doesn't make any sense because in science, a theory is an overarching explanation that explains a lot of data. In common usage, what you're thinking of is the term hypothesis. So saying um, evolution is a theory is correct. It's a fact and a theory in the same way that gravity is a fact and a theory. OK, I've talked a little bit about the past topics. I'm going to spend just a few minutes talking about creationism. Now, looking at all this, looking at all the evidence for evolution, looking at the fact that Christianity is supported by evolution, looking at the fact that practically all scientists support evolution, say, what? why would some creationists dispute this? How could they possibly dispute this? Well, you'll see different creationists take different approaches. Um, but some creationists take a number of approaches, such as stacking the evidence. They'll often take one small piece of evidence, distort it to make it sound like it disputes evolution when it often doesn't, and then they'll fail to mention the thousands of studies that show evolution. They'll often use inconsistent terminology. They won't be clear about what a kind is, as long as you can show evolution from one thing all the way to the other. They'll just group that all into a kind and say, oh, no, you're not having evolution between kinds. They'll imagine some evil conspiracy of scientists to somehow suppress the evidence um, when, of course, that can't be happening based on both the nature of science, which I hope to get into later, and the fact that thousands on, upon thousands of these scientists are Christians. If somehow this was a conspiracy against Christianity, then you really couldn't do it, including a lot of Christians in the conspiracy. They um, engage in full mind, they exaggerate disagreement between science, they'll often argue from ignorance, which I mentioned before, is almost all arguments of uh, irreducible complexity are actually arguments from ignorance that say, because I don't understand the biology, I want you to reject evolution. They'll move the goalposts and they'll continue to use exposed falsehoods. Let's talk a little bit about quote mining. That's taking a quote out of context to make it say something other than what the audience intended. It's basically lying. Here's an example. This creationist puts up a uh, uh, paper that says, um, as the evolutionist astronomers, da 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 da, and he says that they have this mystery that they can't solve about these missing supernova remnants. How can all these missing supernova remnants, you know, not exist? Well, it turns out that if you look at the actual paper they cite, read it, you'll find the sentence that they lifted that phrase right out of. They lifted part of the sentence out of this here. Here's the full sentence. With the above explanation, the mystery of the missing supernova remnants is also solved. Time. Out of time? Time. Okay, sorry, Mr. Signals. We'll pass it on to the group. And we have uh, three minutes. Three minutes. Yeah. Three minutes. Thank you. Um, you said irreducible complexity doesn't prove anything, and we're wrong. Well, you take the parts of your fan motor at home and put them in a box and shake them and see if they turn back into a fan. You've got all the right parts in the right place. They won't. It proves a lot. That's a distortion. I didn't hear any evidence. I just did. well, evolution explains it all. It doesn't. You saw lots of lining up of critters, lots and lots. You take someone from when they're three-year-old watching dinosaur cartoons and send them through 18, 20, 25 years of education where they're taught evolution's a fact, evolution's a fact, evolution's a fact, evolution's a fact. Because the only other alternative is supernatural creation, they're going to line things up. They're going to sound really expert. They're going to draw beautiful pictures. The sequence of bones from reptiles to mammals, 
If you go into that paper, to the original resource, you'll find that some of them are the wrong size, they're in the wrong sequence, some of them are hypothetical, yet they're lined up as a clear sequence. Go find a mammal that's crawling back into the ocean to turn into a whale. Thousands, hundreds of thousands of specific information carrying changes would have to happen for it to ever survive in the ocean. Evolution just waves a brush, lines up in between animals and says, see, we've proven evolution. It's a story. It is not science. It is scientists filtering things through a preconception to support their viewpoint. Um, the whole idea that it's, earlier you said, why? It's irreducible complexity, a whole bunch of things came together at once, but you repeatedly then said, slow gradual changes, slow variations, archaeopteryx. There have been fully formed birds found at lower rock levels. So archaeopteryx can't be the transition. How do you turn a scale into a feather by little gradual, one small little changes at a time? Different protein, different sequence, different alignment, enormous information changes. You see, when you get into the nitty gritty details, evolution just simply doesn't scientifically work. It doesn't work on a molecular level, it doesn't work on a mechanism level, it doesn't work on an evidential level. I could take a hundred million bacteria, put them into a test tube, spin it and break them open so all the right chemicals in the right proportions at the right temperature are in the right location. We can run that experiment over and over and over again and we'll never get a new form of life. See, when you run experiments, you find out it really agrees with creation. I noticed you spent the largest part of your time talking about what do the religious people say, what do the scientists say, as if we can take a poll and determine truth. Science is about experimentation. When you do actual experiments, evolution simply falls apart. Okay, we're going to have an intermission. It'll be about 10 minutes long, uh, depending on the lines of the bathrooms. So we'll be back here about 10 after, 11 after, right in there. Thank you. A lot of questions here. We'll try to get through as many as possible. Okay, I know we're not going to get through all these questions here, so here's what I'm going to do is when we're done here tonight, the questions we don't get through, I'll type them up, I'll present them to each one of our debaters today, and then we'll publish the answers in the newspaper. So that you all get your uh, questions answered. Okay, when they start, we're going to give each of the debaters three minutes to respond to the questions. We'll alternate who starts first. I'll start with Bruce going first this time. Uh, the question is, I heard at a recent uh, International Paleontologist Society meeting that in China, that the Chinese paleontologists said evolution is impossible. Our great fossil deposits show species appear instantly fully developed in transition, in no transition forms. We don't know how life began, but evolution is not possible. Well, I appreciate that at this major scientific conference. Honestly, there is more freedom outside of this country than inside of this country to present any viewpoint other than naturalistic evolution. Part of the reason you never hear all these societies and all these scientists and all this belief in evolution is that should you disbelieve, you put your job, your career, and your academic advancement at risk. Recently published was a book by Blair, Jerry Bergman um, called Slaughter of the Dissidents that documented dozens and dozens and dozens of cases of PhD students that were denied their PhD, high school teachers who lost their jobs, professors that are denied tenure because they even cast doubt upon evolution. That's this culture we live in. So that's honest data. You do see the sudden appearance in the rock le record of enormously different complex creatures. The lowest rock layer is called the Cambrian layer where you see lots of forms of life. 
every major phyla of life is suddenly there. Does that sound like evolution or creation? The trilobites that you love are suddenly there. Jellyfish are suddenly there. Coral are suddenly there. Starfish are suddenly there. Vertebrae, fish with backbones are there. Lower down, there's nothing remotely similar to any of these creatures. How do you go from a single cell organism to a jellyfish and leave nothing in between? How do you go from a single cell organism to a trilobite and leave nothing in between? Now you can find something remotely somehow similar and line them up and put beautiful pictures there and say, see, there's evolution in action, but that's not science and that's not proof. That's interpretation based on a previously existing bias. So yeah, that, they're just simply acknowledging the data. Thank you. Okay, John, you have three minutes. Three minutes, okay. Um, several things I need to point out. First of all, what's been mentioned there is a well-used, often reused quote mine. Thank you. Uh, an often reused uh, false quote mine from this paleontological things. Creationists still use it over and over, even though it doesn't appear to be false or it appears to be good evidence that it was completely made up by a creationist who put that into part of another quote from a scientist at the conference. We've seen more repeated falsehoods. All phyla did not appear in the Cambrian. We've got plenty of phyla shown before that. We also see plenty of transitional forms before that. Bruce, in one hand, said there are no transitional forms right before the Cambrian, and then right after that, he said, oh, there are some, but it's just interpretation. Well, which one is it? According to the experts who look at this stuff and understand it, the biologists themselves, they say that they are transitional forms. We acknowledge experts whenever we go to the doctor and take a prescription. We recognize that the doctors know medicine more than we do, and because of that, we take your, our prescription. If we were going to say that, oh, it's not science unless I can do the experiment myself and I can never rely on an expert, then we would never take our prescriptions because we didn't do the experiment ourselves. Speaking of exper experiments, he talked about doing the nitty-gritty experiments. It is real scientists, not creationists, who do experiments over and over many times to show um, what the truth is, looking for truth wherever the evidence will lead them. Where it leads them is evolution. If you want to talk about experiments, I would ask, what experiments do we have that Bruce has done that confirm any of this? None, because Bruce and I are not experts in this. Bruce and I are not experts, and the difference is that I am up here agreeing with the experts, saying things that the experts would say if they were here, Bruce is up there disagreeing with the experts from being outside the field. That's like someone going in front of the AMA and saying that, oh, germs don't cause disease because you've never seen it for sure happen. Right? Uh, any of us can disagree with the experts from outside the field. If you talk to the people, many of whom are Christian, um, who've actually done the experiments, you'll see that these experiments confirm evolution again and again. There's also other falsehoods I should mention. Um, one of them is the, uh, the idea that, uh, that astrophysicists have no idea how hydrogen could come together to form a star. They've got plenty of models that actually are backed up by real data and by real math. Um, so with that, I'm just about out of my time. And I'd also like to point out that uh, the endogenous retroviruses, um, <coughs> Bruce didn't mention those again because, again, we've got clear confirmation from the scientists that, that does Science. support evolution. Thank you. Okay, question number two is, what is the age of the Earth? Offer evidence. You're first, and by the way, I didn't know we were ranging through the whole debate. I thought we were sticking to the questions. <laughs> okay, we'll try to stick to the questions. Um, well, I, I think we've got a little extra time. We might be able to go off them. The uh, age of the Earth is about 4.6 billion years, and he wanted evidence. I'll give you evidence. We have not just one dating technique, but we have about three dozen different dating techniques that are used to establish the geologic time scale. The geologic time scale has been affirmed by practically all geologists, and that includes many who are Christian. That includes many who are commercial geologists, who don't have to worry about tenure or any kind of phantom pressure from academia. If they could make more money by using creationist ages for the Earth and creationist flood geology, they would, but they don't. 
The ages for the Earth that we have are established by a number of dating methods. I have just uh, 17 of them. <laughs> Notice that they overlap. You wonder how we know what the ages are? We know because you can test a certain sample by many methods. When you test a certain sample by a bunch of different methods, the ages agree. That means that your dating methods are reliable, because if they weren't reliable, they would give different ages. Sometimes creationists will say, oh, these methods disagree with each other. They don't. We've tested thousands of samples, and every time we test them after taking into consideration known problems, they give us the same ages by a variety of different dating methods. And as I pointed out before, you don't have to take my word for anything. You can look right down here. I've got a reference from real geologists, real scientists who spend their entire lives um, studying this and confirming it. Uh, Ralph, how much time do I have? Minute 20. Okay. So, again, this is not just waving a brush and trying to say, oh, this kind of supports evolution. This is the results of scientists from many different backgrounds, many different fields, many different religions, looking at the data, saying the data clearly shows this, looking at real experiments that they've done and do again and again. Creationists generally don't do experiments, and when they do, they do them in a faulty way to give them a predisposed answer. Because we're looking at real experiments, the best way for us in this lecture hall to find out what those experiments are is to look at what the scientific consensus across the globe is. Okay, thank you. Okay, this next question is for Bruce. Oh, don't I get to talk about that question too? Thank you, because this is a very important question. Um, by the way, when uh, just to back up the Cambrian explosion, which dealt on the previous question, I didn't hear him saying, what is it that turned into a trilobite? What is it that turned into coral? What is it turned into those things? They really do suddenly appear very distinct, very early in the rock record. Now, dating methods. In reality, I do a whole hour lecture, and I only have three minutes. No dating method can absolutely prove what the age of anything in the distant past is. You talked about the darling of, of evolutionary naturalism dating methods, which is radiometric, so I'll address that one specifically. The, the fact is, the reason creation science, and it's not creationism, it's the evidence that supports creation versus the evidence that supports evolution. The reason it's science is because we can go and look in science and see what does it show. Is it accurate or not? For most of those dating methods, when the radioactive isotope decays, it kicks out an alpha particle, which grabs an electron and turns into helium. The decay happens in rocks, you end up with helium trapped inside of those rocks. Because of a blindness, and by the way, once again, the big part of your presentation is because the majority believe it, it has to be true. Every scientific discovery is from, if it's a discovery, it's outside of prevailing thought. You train somebody to think only evolution, they have to have enormous periods of time. They're only going to accept old age dating methods. There are hundreds of good valid indicators things aren't that old. Helium is one of them. When that radioactive decay happens, it forms helium. The helium's in the rocks. We only in the last five years did an extensive study of how fast does the helium come out of the rocks. Zircon crystals, trillions of them in granite around the planet, and showed the rate at which that helium, which was formed during the decay, is escaping, shows that those rocks could not possibly be hundreds or millions or billions of years old. They are literally formed thousands of years ago. Apparently, and I don't have the answer to this, so you're going to say it's not science, but we're all still studying these things. There was, during the expansion of this universe, a rapid decay of radioactive forces formed the helium, We've got two pieces of data now. We've got all this decay, which at current rates would take millions of years. We've got helium, which should be long gone, just like a helium balloon still found floating on the ceiling had to have been recently placed there. Two contradictory methods of determining how old are those rocks. Obviously, you're going to accept only the radiometric decay, slow rate method. But there is data indicating that is not the whole answer. And that's just one example of dozens and dozens of examples of different data showing different answers. Um, I believe the Earth was formed literally within the last six, seven, eight, ten thousand 10,000 years at most. I don't put a date to it. Okay, this next question is, is for Bruce. Uh, in 1987, or at least I assume, is, is it Carrie? 
Just, okay. Uh, in 1987, the U.S. Supreme Court unanimously agreed that creationism was a religious belief, not science, and ruled 7 to 2 that teaching creationism in public schools violates First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Um, in the intervening 23 years, creationists have not published a single article in the scientific literature to support the claim. While thousands of articles have been published supporting evolution, what arguments, scientific or legal, could creationists make to change that Supreme Court's court decision? In 1889, the Supreme Court said that blacks are not human beings. Did that make it so? Therefore, they can be slaves. Since when does a Supreme Court decision determine truth? It's just, that's, that's philosophy. That's the, the majority rules, and it gets us in trouble, and it does not determine truth. No scientific papers are ever published determining creation. Dr. John Sanford, PhD, geneticist, Cornell University, published extensively. He explained the downward deterioration of the code upon DNA of creatures. He taught evolution for decades at Cornell until he realized it can't possibly be true. The mechanisms don't make sense. Things are deteriorating downwards. There's not increasing clarity and more information being added with every given generation. It's deteriorating. He came to the conclusion the biblical model has to be true based on the observation of science. And he published this type of information. Dr. Steve Austin, PhD geologist from the University of Pennsylvania, he made an original scientific discovery of a trillion nautiloid shells in the Grand Canyon Red Wall limestone. That's a 600 foot deep layer of limestone in the Grand Canyon. We're told it happened over millions and millions of years. The flood as an explanation for how all these rock layers formed is absolutely pivotal to which one of us is correct. He showed that within a five foot band of that 600 foot, all of these nautiloids died, all the way through Arizona, Utah, out into New Mexico, up into Colorado, thousands of square miles. Wherever you could find that layer exposed, you would find these nautiloids. Then he showed in a scientific paper to the Geological Society that they were oriented statistically in the same flow direction and show the mechanism by which rapid sediment-laden flow water filled with sand would have oriented these shells at the center of that flood flow event, wiping out 600 feet of the geological column as a catastrophic event at a scientific conference. It's never been explained better in any other way. And there's lots of other papers. So that kind of statement is like smoke and mirrors and bluster to try to convince everybody that dude, because the majority believe it, that means it's true. I just, I beg you, dig into the details. Listen to qualified people on both sides and shame on any of us for distorting the viewpoint of our opponents and for believing half myths and truths. We're after truth and you don't get there by distorting things and believing myths. Okay, this next question is from John. What was the... Oh, yeah, I didn't reply to that. Okay, I thought that was just for... Do we, do we want to do that and, and split them up? We could get more questions in if we just... If we should, I think we agreed that we... Okay, would go ahead. Okay. Um, the, uh, the Supreme Court case, again, these are... The, that gives us an example where we can see what happens when you really delve into this and look at it deeply. The Supreme Court justices had a lot of time to look into this much more than we have at this debate. So it makes a lot of sense that they would understand it better than just a couple of quick phrases. The key to that question was that there are not any scientific papers published that support creationism. And the reason for that is because there simply isn't evidence. In the science, the evidence is paramount. If you can present evidence of anything, um, you get published and you get to see what that is. Bruce has mentioned several times that if someone's a creationist, there's this black helicopter conspiracy against them and they get ran out of academia. And then a couple sentences later, he talks about uh, Sanford, who's still in academia and he's a creationist. He's retired. He's, Correction, he's retired. He's retired recently. It, After becoming a creationist. What about, what about Behe? <laughs> After becoming a creationist, is he found Behe retired? He is retired. Behe's retired? I thought you were well, not Behe. Before, not Behe. By the way, Behe is basically an evolutionist who has problems with evolution. He's not you, a creationist. You don't seem to mind quoting his irreducible complexity arguments. I 
I read widely, and wherever I see a valid okay. concept, okay. I certainly, uh, wait, wait. I, I, would, I would say you do too. We use <laughs> okay. concepts from other scientists. Um, I wanted to also mention the Humphreys helium data. Uh, that data has been shown by geologists to be completely bogus because Humphreys used inappropriate lab conditions. Basically, he tried to suck the helium out by taking the uh, stones out, which he misidentified, and uh, <clears throat> putting them under a vacuum when they're under large geologic pressures. Many geologists have shown that that simply isn't a, a way to get real scientific data. So you don't want to try to alter the experimental conditions to get the uh, results that you want. And uh, <clears throat> as we've seen before, um, we do have uh, creationists that can stay in their positions. Uh, Behe, for instance, has stayed in this position for a long time uh, after showing himself to be a creationist. He's an evolutionist. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, he was paid $20,000 to testify in favor of creationism at a trial. Because he did good work, but that doesn't mean he doesn't believe in evolution. He stayed okay, in okay. evolution. Okay, okay. Well, how much time do I have left? 30 seconds. 30 seconds. <laughs> okay. In, uh, in 30 seconds, I'll say I uh, hope everyone's having a fun time. <laughs>
because there was an enormous varieties of life that just appeared in the rock placard. Now, the creation model would say, if the Bible means what it says in a straightforward way, and that's my model, there really was this flood. There would have been things rapidly buried. What are classified as simpler forms of life, coral, shellfish, etc., probably would have been buried deepest and farthest down. Ecological zoning, lots of sorting going forth, same data, same rocks, was there a flood or not? You've got to determine it for yourself. You've got to read both sides and then come to your conclusion. And that is huge for determining what was the first form of life. But regardless, it is so complex, there is no possibility, honestly, scientifically, that chemicals can come alive. It can't happen. It's too... For instance, DNA makes proteins. In order to make the proteins, it has to unzip, make an RNA replica, like a negative, which then grabs amino acids to make the protein. But in order for the DNA to unzip, it has a specifically designed protein that grabs onto the molecules and allows it to separate. So to make the proteins, to make the copies, it has to already have a protein to allow it to unzip. How does all that just happen? It is so phenomenal in its design, it boggles the mind. The first form of life was the whatever forms of life God made as very separate types of creatures. Thank you. But the next question is, please address the st statistical probability of evolution. Bruce, you're first. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but statistics is reality. Um, there, there, I'll give you one example that I use during my lectures because it's, it's so visual. Um, and it goes back a few years, so it may have changed, so don't like slam me on the specifics. I'll try to be general. But a few years ago, at least, the simplest form of life was believed to have about a thousand different proteins. Now, proteins are like little molecular machines. They're like this little machine that unzips the DNA that allows it to make the RNA, that allows it to make the protein, that allows it to make the DNA, kind of a circular thing. Well, for the, an average length protein to be very specifically designed, because if it's not the right protein, it doesn't do any good. It does nothing. And even if you have all the right parts, they still have to come together to form a working mechanism. Waving a flag over things and saying, well, the flagella of a bacteria is explained by evolution explains nothing. It doesn't explain how those parts got there, how they were designed, and how they came together, even if you had them. You can put the 40 chemicals needed to form the flagellum in a flask. They don't form the flagellum. That's science. That is experimentation. But the statistics of just the thousand specifically designed proteins to form one of the earliest believed simplest forms of life was like 10 with 39 zeros after it. That would be like random processes creating those molecules, which is all you have, just random rearrangements of, of amino acids to form the proteins before life's there. All coming together would be like a monkey in front of a typewriter just typing Encyclopedia Britannica by random processes. It would happen once every 10 to the 39th tries. That's a monkey on every square foot of the earth covering the entire globe, stacked 10 miles deep, every second trying one time for 15 billion years in order to get that right one time. See, that's faith. And that's just one of the molecules you need, not even all of them. And even if you have the right molecules, they don't come to life because we've tried that in the laboratory. Science, over and over again, supports a designer behind all of this. Okay, first of all, uh, this gives me an opportunity to, to address a major misconception. Remember, creationists work by confusing the issue by setting up misconceptions about what evolution is and how it works. They will often say that evolution is random. It's random. This is a random thing. How can you come up uh, with life and uh, more than that, biological evolution evolving from, say, uh, fish up to humans uh, from a random process? The key here is that it's not a random process. Biologists will tell you and explain if you want to understand evolution and read perhaps a biology textbook, you'll find that evolution is not random for this reason. Mutations are random in the sense that they could happen anywhere in any way um, in an unpredictable way. However, natural selection is the second major part of evolution. Evolution works by mutations causing variation within the species and then um, natural selection, picking out the variations that are best apt to survive and have kids. 
Natural selection is not random. Therefore, all the ideas and the calculations about this random process stringing together a bunch of mutations don't make any sense. They're not expected to show that evolution could occur. Let me give you a brief example. If you take a sentence, I did this with a sentence about, I think it was 26 characters long, and you do the math, you'll find that there's some ridiculously impossible um, odds of it coming together by just random chance. In other words, if you select these characters, as Bruce was talking about, you end up with a 10 to the 20-something odds of it coming, to, uh, coming together as a sentence. And so you need to try it literally trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of times to make that sentence. But that's a straw man argument. The real test is to say, what if I ran that sentence, and if I got a letter right, I'd keep it. That's how natural selection works. When you get a favorable mutation that is selected for and soon covers the whole population, and then you just have to wait until you get the next favorable mutation. Unfavorable mutations don't hurt you at all because natural selection removes them. You can have a ton of harmful mutation. Natural selection will take them out if they're harmful. If they're not harmful, then it doesn't matter that they're there. So if you run this sentence experiment with something more analogous to real evolution, and keep the letters that fit whatever your target sentence is, what you'll find out is that it happens in about, the calculation I did shows it happening in about 100 tries. You just have to wait after 100 steps to get this, and you don't even have to work very hard to try to get that. You can just let it go because, again, any mutations that don't help are selected against. Creationists will very often neglect the fact that natural selection means that the process is not random. All that's random is the gener generation of mutation, which, by the way, is where the Pope Hi. says God is helping. Can you please close that slide? Yes. <coughs> okay. Um, who's got the first one? John, got the first one here? John's back. Okay. If humans evolved from chimps and other ape species, why are there chimps and apes still present? Okay, that's a common uh, creationist line, and let me explain why that does not show evidence against evolution. I am descended from Germans. There's still Germans over in Germany. The reason that there's still apes around is because you have a speciation event where a small group of apes move off and under different conditions start to evolve into something else, in our case eventually becoming humans. That doesn't mean that the original apes can't still be back wherever they were, still being apes. They did in fact evolve a little bit if you look at the, uh, if you look at their genome um, from what we, uh, what we uh, uh, put together as their common ancestor, but uh, the evolution was much slower because evolution goes at different rates depending on the environment. Things evolve in response to changes in their environment, and when a small group of apes leaves and goes into different environments, it'll evolve into something else. The original apes that stayed back where they were under their similar environment have much less of a selective pressure to become anything else, and so they will tend to stay apes. So remember when a creationist says, why are there still apes? Just think of me and say, why are there still Germans? <laughs> oh, by the way, we just found something to agree on. I know of no creationist who asked that question because it, that's a perfectly valid answer. If, yeah, if, if evolution is true, then you may have branched off and you've got apes and you've got people and you still have both. So there's no argument there. Um, what, what I do want to comment on is that you never, in your rebuttal, answered why natural selection works. It doesn't work. Because for every supposed positive mutation, and there are very, very few examples that have ever been proposed that could allow a creature to move forward, there has to be thousands or maybe tens of thousands of insignificant mutations, un unshowable mutations, little changes that don't even cause a change in the environment. Well, think about it. It's a book. You are destroying the letters and rearranging the letters in the three billion letters in the human genome, and one of them may now and then have a positive use. But meanwhile, lots of information is being destroyed. It doesn't explain evolution. It does the opposite. Natural selection can't, just, can't prevent them, so things start deteriorating downwards. Um, I just wanted to follow up on that because you're right. That, that question is really not a very valid question for saying, well, this is why humans are created. 
Okay, can you go first on this one, Bruce? Um, and, and let's do it this way. Give two minutes on this question for each one because that'll leave me exactly four minutes apiece for our, for, your, for your closing statements. Uh, is it not true that not too long ago all scientific societies agreed that the world was flat and the center of the universe? Well, <laughs> um, I, the point of that question is what I've been trying to make repeatedly. Majority does not determine truth. And we do live in an atmosphere where you are putting your job at risk. It's not a great conspiracy, it's a mindset. Evolution's a fact, evolution's a fact, evolution's a fact. Therefore, anybody who believes otherwise isn't validly qualified to teach in our school, and, and they are eliminated because of that. It's indoctrination that leads to a natural consequence, not a conspiracy. And we're living with that consequence where our kids in schools aren't even allowed to see the kind of things I've been presenting. They're just filtered from their view. Now, yeah, the, the majority of scientists believed a lot of wrong things in the past. Does that mean they're wrong today? Not necessarily, which is why you gotta look at the data. You gotta look at the experimentation. You gotta look at the implications. You gotta look at what natural selection can actually do. Can it add increasing levels of complex information to the DNA code? No, it can't. It's a smoke screen to believe it can. It's a belief system. The opposite is actually happening. We are not evolving upwards. New species, new, new very different types of animals are not forming. Uh, and just because scientists in the past believed in a flat earth or they were wrong about this or wrong about that, doesn't necessarily mean evolution's wrong today, but it doesn't mean it's right either. Um, look at all the information and, and look for the truth that I believe you'll find it. Okay, um, yes, I do want to encourage everyone to look into the truth. Look at, now, Bruce says the majority of scientists, it's much more powerful than that, as I showed before. Practically all scientists look at this data, including many Christians, they look at it over and over again, they spend their whole years looking at the, their whole lives looking at this, and, uh, and it affirms evolution. Now, let me, uh, let me briefly talk about this conspiracy that keeps coming up. I've never said conspiracy. I deny there is a conspiracy. Okay, so not don't conspiracy, use, don't twist my words. A mindset, a mindset then. Um, the truth of the matter is that in science you are greatly rewarded, greatly rewarded, if you show evidence against the prevailing view. Remember, a lot of scientists are Christian, they're certainly not going to um, form a, a group against the... Uh, oh, no, sorry, that was my fault. Okay. okay. Okay, if you look at great scientists of the past, what you will find is that again and again, scientists have been greatly rewarded for presenting evidence against the prevailing view. I worked in science for a long time, and what I found in, in a research lab, not in an industrial setting, when I was at Northwestern University, there are scientists upon scientists, all of them out there, in a very competitive cutthroat world, searching to find any bit of evidence that they can verify through experiment that doesn't fit the prevailing view. Einstein is famous and known because he was able to present evidence that didn't fit with Newton's, gravi with Newton's uh, gravitational and physical theories. So, why, would, why was Newton famous? Because he showed evidence that didn't fit with Aristotle. This happens again and again. It happened with Dirac, with... Hi. Uh, Okay, we are into the closing arguments now, or our closing cases. Uh, and John, you will go first. You have four minutes. Okay, four minutes. I um, want to start off by reiterating that evolution is an idea that the theologians, both Protestant, many Protestant, and Catholic, affirm supports the core doctrines of Christianity. These are the theologians that have spent an awful long time, their entire careers, studying the Bible often it's in its original Hebrew. And moving on to the evidence, we saw some of the evidence for evolution. If you want more, please read biology textbooks and look at the evidence of, from both sides. A good example is uh, the Top Origins website that has links to the creationist uh, rebuttal so you can actually read both back and forth. So I do recommend that, as Bruce did. Um, 
Now, if you look at the, the practically all scientists that support evolution, uh, because of that, and because everything I've said tonight is in accordance with what all these scientists say, and because of that, it is as if I brought the hundreds of thousands of scientists with me tonight. The, um, <clears throat> the evidence in support of evolution is overwhelming. They will tell you and they will show you and allow you to look at the detailed experiments. The, uh, the other thing that's worth bringing up at this time is that this overwhelming majority um, of scientists, this practically all scientists that support evolution, show that, um, that by looking into the data in detail, you can see how it, um, how it supports evolution, which is an important part of science in America. We are going to need to compete in the global marketplace against other countries, and that means we have to have the best science education possible. That includes the foundational theories of most modern fields, including biology, if we're going to be able to compete in areas like biomedicine and things like that. Now, creationism has and continues to greatly hurt science education by, by preventing the full explanation and teaching of evolution due to concerns of um, parent responses. If you look at the N, uh, NSCE, the NCSE, they've got a graph where you can look at across the United States and see where this damage is occurring. The, uh, the upshot there is that creationism greatly hurts science education, greatly hurts the future of our kids. From, from my own personal experience of watching how things play out, I think that creationism not only hurts science education, I think it also significantly hurts Christianity. And the reason I think this might be the case, this is the only thing in my talk that I don't have direct evidence for, is the fact that I've personally seen plenty of people who have been raised saying that you have to be creationist if you're Christian. We've seen from the theologians that that's not true, but that's what they were told. They get to an age where they can look at all this evidence and they find out that, uh, that the evidence supports evolution and they leave Christianity. It doesn't have to be that way. The two are compatible. Now, the National Centers for Science Education, and uh, I checked also with the National, um, with the United States National Academy of Sciences, they gave me permission to include their book on this disc that contains a lot of information about evolution and creationism. I encourage everyone to grab one on the way out, and also to grab um, one of these oranges. I've got oranges because, remember, our ape ancestors had a non-functional vitamin C gene that we inherited. So we got all these oranges. My helpers in the lab will also be handing out chewable vitamin C tablets. <laughs> Right, here's the question John keeps referring to. Um, in, in, um, so let me just pose it. If the evidence for creation is so strong, and by the way, I've been talking about the laws of thermodynamics, I've been talking about chemistry, I've been talking about genetics, I've been talking about science, I've been showing experiments that would lead you to a conclusion. John's been mostly lining up fossils, talking about uh, similarities. That's not science either. So, but the question he keeps posing over and over and over and over again, if the evidence is so strong, why don't more people accept it and reject evolution? Well, here's the primary reason. It's not a conspiracy, it is a set of presuppositions that force you to filter everything you're coming to conclusion about through that lens. This is a quote by Richard Dickinson. He's a prominent biochemist, evolutionist. These are the kind of people who set the standards for what gets into your textbooks. And by the way, the uh, book by the National Academy of Sciences, I think if it's the same one, Science, Evolution, and Creationism. See, it's not the evidence for creation, it's a religion. Um, a lot of that has even been refuted in the last couple of years, but you have to read it to find out. So what does Richard Dickinson say? He says, science fundamentally is a game, you don't hear that very often, with one overriding and defining rule. Let's see how far and what extent we can explain the box, everything, physical and material universe, in terms of only what's in the box. No other explanation allowed. Well, obviously, the majority are going to do that because it's the rules of the game. Involving God in the explanation constitutes intellectual cheating, says this expert in science. 
Why a chess player is capable of grabbing his opponent's king and smashing it to the floor, but that doesn't make him the champion because he didn't follow the rules. So you see, you define the rules over time, you gradually train generations that this is the reality, and obviously the majority are going to focus things, filter things through that worldview. Now, for a hundred years, America won more Nobel Prizes than the rest of the world combined while creation and recent creation of biblical truth was being taught as reality. The founders of modern science, most of them believed in a recent relevant creation, had no trouble at all developing all of the modern equations, the Maxwellian equations, the Faraday's, others, Pasteur, didn't, was no detriment at all for them developing science, because that's operational science. What we're talking about is where did we come from, and it has enormous implications. You see, what I've shown over and over again are the black swans, which have not been refuted. John just keeps wanting to push white swans. It's not science, it's philosophy. You know, does it affect religion? Absolutely. Does it affect reality and belief? Absolutely. Does it affect Christianity? Yes, you can be a Christian and believe in evolution, but you're being inconsistent. This is what Jesus said. When Nicodemus, a man, came to him to ask who he was, and by the way, Christ claimed to be God dozens of times, including John 3.16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, referring to himself, that whoever believed in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Four verses earlier, he said, Nicodemus, if I tell you of earthly things, and you don't believe them, why would you believe me when I tell you of heavenly things? You see, the Bible gives us a model for biology. If it's wrong, why believe the rest of it? It gets a model for geology. If it's wrong, why believe the rest of it? It gives us a model for why human beings behave the way they do and where death came from. If it's wrong, why believe anything else? Why believe the spiritual stuff? In today's vernacular, Jesus would say, if I told you of scientific things and you don't believe them, why would you believe me when I tell you of spiritual things? And where I'm going to wrap up, Romans 1, evolution directly contradicts the Bible. It says... What we can know about God is nice. absolutely plain because of what he's made. Okay. Thank you. Well, I see not too many people left during intermission, which means that these guys did a pretty good job. Thank you, John. Thank you, Bruce. And as I said, please, the books and the CDs that are gifts, so please put them to use, and thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Thank you for spending a Saturday night here. And we will get those questions in the paper. That fits creation just as well, very distinct kinds. Nobody disputes there's all sorts of variations within a given set of DNA information of a given type of animal. Well, lots of varieties of cows, lots of varieties of corn, lots of kinds of dogs that vary within a kind. The question is, can you start with no information content and random goo and have random changes and have that goo go through the zoo to turn into you? Kind of like, are we goo men, or are we created? That's the real question. And you don't do that by lining things up and saying, see, this proves evolution, or showing similarities between things. That's looking for the white swans. You do it by saying, do the laws of science confirm or undermine this whole belief in evolutionary thought? Another way of looking at it, did stuff, just matter and energy, turn into life, that became conscious as mankind and then invented this idea of God. That's essentially what's taught in the school systems and museums and everywhere. Because it's assumed 
in our education system that the entire universe is like this box. Everything is the box. There's nothing that made the box. The box made itself. That's evolution in a nutshell. But the other possibility isn't even allowed viewing within our school systems. The idea that there is an intelligent designer. We call him God. And that he made the stuff. He made the box. He made life. And he made mankind. See, there's the two possibilities shown in another way. What science has to explain is where these kind of things came from. Is all a tune design, the perfect electromagnetic constants, the, the, the strong and the weak magnetic force, the perfect position of Earth, the perfect distance from the sun, everything that holds the universe together, the charge of the electron, the, the constants of gravity, all of them that have to be perfectly tuned for life to be possible, are those all just a matter of random chance? Or is it a tune design? Is this the specified information design of DNA, and we're going to talk about that as we move along, a result of random processes, the property of matter, or is there a designer? Are living organisms, the interdependent design that makes organisms and every part of organisms possible, a result of design or just a property of matter? Only science can answer that. And this is what you get in the schools and the textbooks. Well, just lots of time and chance explains it all. That's just a smoke screen. That's not science. That's belief. Or mutations filtered by natural selection explain it all. We'll talk specifically about that as we move along. Or just an infinite amount of time. That's a reliance on faith, not science. Or maybe it's the property of matter itself. We'll look at the laws of science to see is it or isn't it. Or maybe just chaos theory. That's real popular now. Order can happen in chaos. Well, that's another faith statement. Has not been proven. Of all the things you'll hear about in the school systems, the things that are allowed in school, there's one possibility that's always left out. Isn't that interesting? Created by intelligence. It's simply left out. And the data which would tend to lead us to that conclusion isn't even shown to the kids. That one is off limits. What a crazy situation we find ourselves in in this nation. Only guiding people toward one possible conclusion. You see, that's indoctrination. That's not education, because one of the possibilities is being left out. Now, you all know this, the evolution model. As I said, what's presented as evolution are minor variations between creatures that neither one of us disagree happen. But does that explain the upward development of life? Can hydrogen gas come together in a vacuum to form a star? That's cosmic evolution. Can chemicals come alive? Never been done. We're not even close. My name is Ralph Works, Managing Editor of the Middle Daily News. And I noticed just like in church, there's more empty seats up front than there are in the back. So it's pretty normal. Um, to get started with these two gentlemen who are going to de be debating tonight, uh, I just wanted to make, let you know that they got more guts than I have. Because I've learned after 30 years in the newspaper business, uh, you know, as a reporter and as a managing editor now, that there's three things you don't write about if you don't want to get criticized. And that's one's abortion, one's gun control, and the other one's evolution. So you can't change anybody's mind, so you just try to educate. Um, the two gentlemen are frequent letter writers for the Middle Daily News. And I've come to know their thoughts and their, their deeds over the years. And I've come to respect both their positions because they're very committed, but they're very civil about it. And that's one of the things that I think we need to take into consideration tonight. When you frame your questions, make sure they're all very civil and because this is not a personal debate. This debate has been going on since probably before Charles Darwin published the species book back in 1859, 151 years ago. 
and it's been going on in the United States for a lot longer than the monkey trial in Tennessee in 1925. So I don't think it's been settled at that time. We're probably not going to settle anything tonight. So let me introduce both the people. On my left is Bruce Malone. He has 28 years of research experience with the Dow Chemical Company and retired as a research leader position in 2008 in order to spend full time presenting the evidence for creation. Bruce has a BS degree in chemical engineering from the University of Cincinnati and holds 17 patents for new products with Dow. He has authored or co-authored four books on the evidence for creation and over 90,000 copies are in circulation. Bruce and his wife Robin have been married for 26 years and have four children. They have been Midland residents for 13 years. On my right is John Cleveland Host, has never debated before, and his scientific expertise is in material science, not in biology, geology, or any of the other fields relevant to evolution. But he is a lifelong supporter of science education. He has studied material science at Michigan Tech, <coughs> earned his PhD degree in material science at Northwestern. He has authored a half dozen papers through the peer review process, including a paper in the journal Nature. Since 1997, he has worked at Hemlock Semiconductor. Uh, he has taught general science education classes at local colleges. Uh, he grew up near Pontiac and has lived in Michigan most of his life. John and his wife live here in Midland with their three sons, and he enjoys hunting, kayaking, and camping. His three sons have been his inspiration for a greater involvement in promoting education science. With that said, uh, also in the program, you can see how we're going to be uh, organizing tonight. Each person will get 25 minutes to present their, their program. And it's already been, it's not a coil flip, by the way, it's a coin flip. And it's already been taken care of, and Bruce will be going first. Uh, and then, after each presentation, close to even beginning to explain how it can happen in a laboratory. All sorts of reasons it could not happen, never been done, caught chemical evolution. Then life diversified in one form turned into another, that turned into another, that turned into another, and finally monkeys of some sort turned into man. Biological evolution supported by this idea of geological evolution. You know, in graphically it's like explosion formed all this matter and energy somehow, and all that information on the DNA code, it is information just developed by chance, and then you line up the fossils, which I'm sure my, my opponent here is going to do, kind of line them up and say, well, see, we can place them in this order, and that proves evolution's happened. And then you get to the little end, of the branch at the end, and you say, well, monkeys look closest to us, apes look closest to us, we'll line them up, we'll see any variation of human skulls, that must have been humans evolving, any variation of ape skulls that were apes turning into humans, and we'll line those up. See, it's a story. That's what's going on throughout the educational system. Well, there's another model. You see... In, in my mind, it doesn't even qualify as science. It's a model, a belief system to fit the data into. There's another model, which also doesn't qualify as science per se, but it's a model to help understand reality. I think the best one is really the biblical model. It says the universe and life was designed. It looks like a design because it has a designer. There were very distinct forms of life that were formed by this designer. Death is a result of our actions. It hasn't been here for millions and billions of eons in time. But you've got to explain the rock layers. They're there because there was an enormous water-wide world restructuring catastrophe that really is a reality of this planet. And that's where you get the rock layers and the fossils and so on. And the people diversified into people groups after that. It's another model to explain reality. Now, we both have the same data, we have the same rocks, we have the same fossils, it's a matter of which one fits the reality of the evidence best. And you can't figure this out in a philosophy class or a religion class. You see, we've got to talk about cosmology and science of cosmology and physics. We've got to talk about biology. If the Bible gave us a model to understand reality, ten times in the first chapter it says, creatures reproduce after their own kind. Ten times. Birds, trees, fish, cattle, other things, reproduce after their own kind. You see, that's biology. The only way you're going to figure out if it's true is to go study the biological world. So it belongs in a classroom to figure it out if it's true or not. Psychology. Every human heart is fractured. Is there something wrong there? Why can't we always, 100% of the time, do what we know is right? See, there's a problem here. That's psychology. Geology. 
talks more about this worldwide flood in the Bible than it does creation itself, presented in a very straightforward way as a reality and fact of history. And in history, see, those are scientific disciplines to be studied not in a religion class, but in science. But they're left out. They're left out of our school system. Now, this is why. You know, Kansas said, if you're going to teach evolution, at least teach the problems with it in Kansas in 1999. The media went ballistic. The scientific establishment went ballistic. They moved in with their editorials. They said, we're going to drag the kids into the dark ages. They'll never be able to compete. This was one of the editorials by a PhD scientist. Even if all the data pointed to an intelligent designer, we'd have to exclude it because it doesn't say the box is all there is. And that's the only thing that's allowed in our schools. Isn't that a travesty? It's a travesty. We're not even allowed to show people the data. So let's look at the data. The first law of thermodynamics. By the way, a law is only a law of science if there's never been an exception, never been anything that's ever been shown to be wrong with it. It says matter and energy can be neither created nor destroyed. Now this is a huge elephant in the living room. There'll be a, like a three minute response. And then after both people have given their answers, then we will be going in for a small 10 minute inter intermission. And then we'll come back for questions. If anybody has any questions, put on the cards. Uh, Joel and Tyler Roy will be around to pick up the cards and bring them up to me. Uh, I will be asking the questions. I'll try to ask the questions in the order that I get them. But if there's some redundancies or anything of that nature, I'll take the editorial position of reorganizing myself. So, um, And if it looks like there's going to be way too many, because I figure we can get in six to eight um, questions at the end, maybe more if, they're, if they don't go very long, because each person will have a chance to respond to them, then I will take that opportunity also to um, pick the questions that we're going to get in, and, it's, and unfortunately some might not. So, but let's begin our debate. Bruce Malone. This looks, this looks like a place to be in Midland tonight. Thank you so much for coming. I know there's many things you could have been doing, but you chose to come and uh, listen to the two of us talk about where we came from, and I thank you for that. Um, I Hopefully I will be able to bring some clarity tonight. I, I think that's my goal, is to just do some teaching of things that you aren't going to get to hear in the museums and the public schools because they are essentially left out. You don't get to hear the science that lines up with anything but evolution out there. In reality, there are only two possibilities for why you are always sitting there in those seats, why you exist. Um, either one sort of creature turned into another sort of creature that turned into another sort of creature. In other words, natural processes over enormous periods of time made you as a human being, or you were created. Now, those are the only two possibilities. Either the coded language, which is on the DNA molecule, was there as a result of an intelligent designer, or it happened by random mutational changes filtered by natural selection. Those are the only two possibilities. Either there was an enormous worldwide water catastrophe on this planet as an explanation for the fossil record and the geology and the river frames and the ice age and so on, or enormous periods of time created the geological record. There's no other possibility. It's one or the other. So the question is, how can science guide us toward what is the truth? Because I would hope that's what we're all after. What is the truth? The reality is science cannot prove either possibility in a definitive way. Karl Popper, Dr. Karl Popper, he was kind of a founder of how does science work and really defining it as a systematic method in the 30s and 40s, a scientific philosopher. He said science works by showing which a possibility is the least likely, and that's the one you eliminate. It can never definitively prove one thing or another. Evolution is presented as a fact all around us, but it's not. It is really a philosophy that the, the data is then filtered through. Now, this is the way Carl put it. He said, science is like the white swan test. Now, what is that? Suppose I had a theory that said all swans are white. Now, would I go about proving that theory by going to Indiana and finding another white swan, and Colorado and finding another white swan, and flying over to Europe and finding another white swan, and everywhere I look, I find more and more white swans in order to prove my theory? No, it's gotta, you've got to find some way of falsifying it. 
I've never found anything evolutionists are willing to accept as falsifying their theory. They just fit it and mold it and change it to fit what they want to believe. In reality, the way you disprove something is to look for a black swan. Then you've proven all swans are white. And that's the kind of things we're going to look at. Now, my opponent, I suspect, is going to start lining up fossils in the fossil record and see, see how they line up and show the pattern of evolution? Well, a problem for naturalism, for evolution. Then where did everything come from? You can't explain it, because it goes against what we know about the laws of science. Creation at least has a cause and effect. There's something outside the box that made the box. Evolution, as I said earlier, is faith. It has faith that nothing exploded and became everything. Now, lest you think it's just me making this up, I'm going to show a little two-minute video clip of a PhD cosmologist from the University of Arizona explaining <coughs> cosmic evolution to us all. I'm Jana, and I'm a professor of physics and astronomy. I work on where it all started. The simplest picture of the Big Bang starts with nothing. There's really nothing. There's no space, there's no time, there's no matter, there's no energy. It's nothing but the potential to exist. And out of that bursts the universe. Time starts, space is created, all the matter and the energy in the universe is born at that moment. In the first minute fraction of a second, the universe inflates. And then about three minutes later, atoms begin to form. And about five billion years later, galaxies begin to form. One of these galaxies, about 10 million years later, a little ordinary planet forms, and 14 billion years later, people evolve. We're at the last bleep um, in the cosmic history. Big Bang is often misunderstood as an explosion in space, as though space existed and time existed, and there was just this explosion of matter and energy into space. But something much more profound than that is going on, and that is space itself is created in the Big Bang, and time is created in the Big Bang. The Big Bang describes the origin of the entire universe. But we also know that the math that we're doing on pen and paper isn't going to be the whole story. It's possible that the universe was really a bounce from a previous history when the universe was already big and started to collapse and bounced out into a new Big Bang. And then we were born in this cosmos that we think started 14 billion years ago, but really it goes back infinity to infinity, uh, an, an eternity of bounces and cycles like this. Or it's possible that our universe is just one kind of bubble or plume off of a patchwork of other bubbles and plumes, and so there's other universes out there. It's like a megaverse, but we can't contact them, so for all we know, this is it. This is the whole cosmos, back to our beginning and our big thing. But it might not be that way. But we know something happened, something that created a hot space from which the universe expanded and evolved. Okay, something happened, but we're in agreement there. You say space, none of that's provable. Infinite universes, infinite time, nothing, just the potential to be something existed. See, it's faith, faith, faith presented as if it's reality and science. And, uh, but it's done in such glitzy ways that people just kind of buy into it. So, is it, actually, our observations, when we really understand science, say it couldn't have happened. You see, when you put hydrogen gas in a vacuum of space, it does not gravitationally collapse to become a star. We're told that maybe in all sorts of possibilities, maybe there were supernovas that created shock waves that drove gases together to form stars. Well, where did the stars come from to form the supernovas to form the shock waves? It's just circular, circular thing. And furthermore, we've never seen a star even form. Not once have we taken a photograph of the sky and 50 years later compared to another photograph and see a new star. So observation and theory can't explain it. Here's uh, Stephen Hawking essentially saying the same thing. He says, smartest man on the, on the planet, some people say. We can't even develop a model of how the cosmos forms without 